Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Is my mic on? Good. My name is Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, and I am the Emily Hargroves Fisher Research Professor of Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the first AXWITH Forum of the academic year. The AXWITH Forums are HGSE's signature public lecture series. The forums highlight leaders in the field, share new knowledge, generate spirited conversation, and offer insight into the highest priority challenges facing education. We are delighted that you have joined us today here in person and via live stream. And we hope that you will join us for future forums. I'd like to begin by introducing our speaker for this evening, Dr. Eve Ewing. Those of you who are teachers know that there is nothing that makes us happier than to follow and be inspired and provoked by the developmental journey of our students. To watch them find their voices, hit their stride, develop their groove, and take off and soar. You can imagine how I feel witnessing the extraordinary accomplishments and ascent of my former student and advisee, now colleague and friend, Dr. Eve Ewing. In Yiddish, the term for the feeling I'm having now is nakas. It means to feel proud without feeling prideful. A kind of pride, a proud that gives the credit, agency, and ownership to the one who has actually carved the path, navigated the journey, and produced the work. As Eve's teacher, I've had the privilege of an intimate longitudinal view. When Eve Ewing arrived at Harvard as a first year doctoral student in 2011, I noticed a shadow of melancholy underneath her signature radiance. In her transition to the academy, she was missing being a teacher. Work she cherished, work that was life-giving, she was mis missing mixing it up with her middle school students from Chicago's South Side, missing their energy, their inquisitiveness, their probing minds, their laughter and mischief. As she settled into the Harvard culture, the routines and rituals, the expectations and discourses, she rediscovered her passion for the life of the mind, relishing and nourishing her intellectual journey and becoming over the years a first-rate scholar. Her inquiry focused on matters of race, schooling, and social justice. Eve's masterful doctoral dissertation allowed her to go home again, revisit her melancholy, and train her lens on the community and children she had left behind five years earlier. Ghosts in the schoolyard, racism and school closings in Chicago's South Side, her 2017 book that grew out of her dissertation, is a portrait of the South Side community of Bronzeville, an important site of African-American culture and history from the Great Migration to the present, where in 2013, 53 schools, largely poor and black, were closed by the district claiming underutilization, low academic performance, and budget limitations as the cause. Eve wanted to examine what disputes about the role of race in the Chicago school closings could teach us about the broader societal tensions regarding racism and urban school policy. Her investigation was innovative in its methodological synergies and counterpoint, using historical sociology to explore the racialized socio-political changes in Bronzeville and the relationship of school public policy to the fall of public housing using critical discourse analysis of public hearings and meetings to compare the dissonant strains of district officials and community members, using portraiture to create a probing narrative about the protests and hunger strikes that surrounded the closing of one high school beloved by generations of Bronzeville residents, and finally composing a theory of institutional mourning a framework for understanding the emotional aftermath of school closure for community members, parents, teachers, and students, a poignant juxtaposition of love and loss. By the end of her magnificent, move, magnificent and moving work, 
Eve has reframed our understanding of the power of place, of home, of institutional affiliation. We hear the historical echoes and haunts of enslavement and the contemporary experiences of disempowerment and marginalization embedded in what is presented as objective measures of efficiency and evaluation in the school closings. Eve lifts up and amplifies the voices of teachers, parents, and students who see and name the layers of deceit and obfuscation, blaming and shaming that are barely masked by the bureaucratic language and policies of district officials. And woven throughout the text, there are the voices of Chicago poets, offering powerful metaphors, illusions, and images that add heart and soul, beauty, and subtlety to the empirical description. As if this soulful and searing, rich and rigorous investigation into the school closings and race in Chicago were not enough to capture Eve's full attention when she was a student here at HGSE. She was also making art, writing and performing poetry and producing visual pieces, prints and installations for museums. She was already leading a mostly stealth, layered life, <laughs> crossing the boundaries of theory and practice, blending genres, modalities, and methodologies, bridging art and science, speaking to different audiences, and getting ready to publicly emerge as the self-described scholar, writer, and cultural organizer. Chicago is her birthright. Chicago is her beat. Dr. Eve Ewing, a sociologist of education, is an assistant professor at the University of Chicago's School of Social Service Administration, where she focuses on racism, social inequality, and urban policy, and the imprint of these forces on American public schools and the lives of young people. Ewing is a prolific author working in myriad genres. Electric Arches, her first collection of poetry, essays, and visual art, received awards from the American Library Association, the Poetry Society of America, and was named one of the best books of the year by the Chicago Tribune and NPR. Her second collection, 1919, tells the story of the race riot that rocked Chicago in the summer of that year. She is also co-author with Nate Marshall of the play, No Blue Memories, The Life of Gwendolyn Brooks, and perhaps most exciting to my 11-year-old granddaughter, Paloma, and zillions of other young, gifted, and black girls, she writes the Ironheart series for Marvel Comics. <laughs> Ewing's writings, installations, and performances are all enlivened and infused with her political activism and cultural organizing in nonprofit institutions across Chicago. I do not know about you, but I feel breathless. <laughs> Just offering this brief account of Eve's peripatetic life. How does she do it all? Does she ever sleep? How does she find coherence, balance, and integrity in her work across these multiple domains? How does she fuse and meld her several identities? With what voice does she speak to her various audiences? What gives her inspiration? and anchoring in her fast-moving navigations through these many worlds. Eve Ewing's, Eve Ewing's talk today, beautifully titled Into a Daybreak, Thinking and Writing Through Black Feminism, will, I believe, begin to give us a glimpse into the threads of coherence, the balance of weights, the sources of inspiration that bind together the layers and spheres of Eve's work. After her presentation, Eve and I will have a conversation for about a half an hour and then open the floor for your questions and comments. So let us welcome back Dr. Eve Ewing. I was just waiting to see which chair you would not yes. sit in and then I would sit in that chair. That was so Eve Ewing. <laughs> and so magnificent, so Thank wonderful, you. so beautifully integrated and synthesized. And, um, I must say, I you are Riri. You know, I mean, you, doesn't she look like Riri? I mean, you know, and, and there's so much that that um, is reflected in you Thank that you, you. Refle that you write about in her. Thank you. Um, I I want to begin by saying, what's in a name? 
sort of what's in a name. And the first time that I read Alice Walker's book, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, she used a fabulous phrase that I hung on to and, I, and I've used ever since, which is womanism. Mm -hmm. And it was womanism where we black feminist, actually, um, whose notion, notion of critically analyzing both sexism and anti-black racism and their intersection one with the other. She said, womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender, um, as a way of talking about it. And I'm wondering, because in your talk today, you didn't mention right. Alice or this term, whether the way she talked about it is anything like what you think about as black feminist thought. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we talked a little bit about this earlier. In Search of Our Mother's Gardens is one of those essays that you, I can take myself back to the moment when I first read it because it was just like, like being just slapped in the face with something that you, that you knew to be true. And I think that, um, it's almost, I don't want to say immaterial, but, you know, I think that, I think of womanism and black feminism as being very much the same thing, theoretically. I think in terms of what term people to use, choose to use, you know, I think that there's a way in which womanism and the, the, the etymology of the word woman can be exclusive to people who, you know, are non-binary but present as feminine or identify mm -hmm. as femmes mm -hmm. or things like that. But you could say the same issue with feminism, right, mm -hmm. um, etymologically. And so to me, I, you know, I don't see it any particular way. I do like that the word black is in black feminism. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's that, but I'm, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's immaterial to mm -hmm. me. One of the things you talked about was acting womanish, which is a southern right. rural term. Right. Uh, and when you used it for girls, it meant that that girls were courageous and serious and more grown than you'd expect at right. their age. But it could also be a disparaging term, exactly. right? Because it means you're fast or yes. you're, you're, you're talking too much or mm -hmm. you speak too but much. But the way she understood it was right. the other, right? Which mm -hmm. I thought reminded me of Riri, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> serious and grown. Um, what about black feminists and black men? Where do they fit into your thinking about all of this? Well, I think a black feminist can be a black person of any gender. Um, and I also think that black, if you're not black, you can't be a black feminist. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry, actually. Uh, <laughs> but you can learn from black feminism, right? You can yes. be an intersectional feminist, and mm -hmm. you can be someone who studies in the tradition of black feminism. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that can, is important for people of, of any and all gender identities. Um, I think that there's a way in which... Uh, we have been conditioned to think that black feminists are somehow in ideological opposition to black men. Um, and many of you may have seen, and if you haven't, you should go see the amazing documentary about Toni Morrison that came out recently if yeah. you need more fodder for your Toni yeah. Morris, Morrison uh, morning time, which I do. Um, but one of the critiques that was made of her uh, by many very prominent black scholars uh, and writers, mostly black men, uh, was that her work, Char I'm gonna name names, Charles Johnson said in the Washington Post, I have receipts that, uh, <laughs> he said in the Washington Post that Toni Morrison's work is offensive to whites and offensive to black men, it denigrates black mm, men. Mm. And if you read the work of Toni Morrison, not only is her work not denigrating to black men, mm. but actually in works like Song of Solomon, she writes so beautifully and trenchantly and tenderly and allows an interior life to black men that is rare in American literature, which is why she's the greatest American novelist of the 20th century. Yeah. And so uh, not one of the greatest as all the, uh, the obituaries would have you believe, right? She was the greatest. And so, I think that the reason that this seems to me in a fallacious way to be attention to people is because we are accustomed to a society in which black women are asked to silence their particular concerns or their particular questions or issues of justice or identities in order for the supposedly grander project of racial justice or gender justice to proceed with, as I kind of tried to say, in a way that excludes the very existence of black women, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, interpartner inter violence or, you know, abuse, ma many black women in America die at the hands of their male partners. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a terrible, horrible thing. And for me, that is a racial justice issue, right? It's a racial justice issue, both because black women are people and exist, and are when we think about what a black issue is, ought to be included in that. And it's also a racial justice issue because how do we want to make a space where people are not moving 
move to patriarchal violence, right? How do we want to imagine a more expansive idea of what it means to be a human rather than just assume that that, that is okay? And so I think that when you start asking those kinds of questions, uh, that is perceived as challenging or denigrating in some way to black men, which I think is just a logical fallacy. And um, yeah. How do we manage this sort of tension between thinking about black fem feminist um, and the sort of enormous variation among us, right? At the same time, had, um, at the same time as we want to think about solidarity of voice and perspective. Yeah, I think that's so important both within as an intra-racial question and an interracial question. Mm -hmm. um, I just came back from Australia, which I'm very tired. <laughs> I came back yesterday at 4 p.m. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about a lot as I was there was um, Aboriginal identity yeah. as a, a, with a history with which I saw as kind of intersecting in interesting ways with the histories of both black and native people in the U.S. context. And many Aboriginal people self-identify as black and they, right. they spell it black without the C. Mm -hmm. um, are they black fellas is also a term that people use. And it, it just got me to thinking, in a, you know, whenever you travel internationally, it just pushes you to think in expansive ways about blackness. And I think what I'm interested in is I'm certainly concerned with the historically particular necessities of black liberation, mm -hmm. but I'm also concerned with fighting for freedom and struggling forward with whoever wants to be in that struggle. And I am concerned with both trying to understand how people who are different from me have their own historical struggles in this country, which creates racial stratification as through different vectors of all upholding white supremacy, right? And so when my Asian American friend is asked where you're from, where are you really from, right? Mm -hmm. That is upholding the system of white supremacy that is also harmful to me, right? Mm -hmm. When native people are excluded or uh, just erased from conversation, that is upholding a, a vector of white supremacy that is also harmful for me. And I also want good things for those people because they're also my people, right? Mm -hmm. And furthermore, we have to look inward and ask questions about how even within conversations about black liberation, how are we not only sidelining but actively harming trans people, disabled people, undocumented people, right, dark-skinned people, whatever, all, these vectors of, of inequality and stratification within our groups are also really important to talk about because otherwise we can end up kind of anointing people who get to be the spokespeople, yeah. right, while, uh, you know, just to give one example, uh, deaf people who are also black are a particular risk for police violence, right? Black disabled people mm -hmm. generally are a particular mm -hmm. risk for police violence. Mm -hmm. To me, that is a disability rights issue and it's a racial justice issue. And if I brush that off and say, well, that doesn't concern me, then I have a very narrow view of what black liberation looks like. It has mm -hmm. to be for everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Um, switching gears a little bit, if it's okay. I'm interested in hearing more about the synergies across your work and how you, how you think about anchoring your several identities. Mm -hmm. And so I want to try out a few of those that I think are very important. Okay. And the first one is Chicago. Yes. Um, I really do. Chicago ones here? <laughs> uh, I just believe that of all the things that makes you able to do all of these things mm -hmm. um, across all of these domains um, and gives you the opportunity for expression and identification and artistry. Chicago, the sense of place mm -hmm. and being rooted in place is very important. Could you speak to that? Sure. Um, well, Chicago is the greatest known city in the multiverse. So that's <laughs> a scientific fact. Okay. So there's that. But, there are, there are a few other things I would say. I'll say tentatively three. Um, one is that Chicagoans have a very, uh, specifically within literature, Chicagoans have a very strong sense of self-identity. So I compare it sometimes to New Orleans, which I think is an imperfect comparison, but to me, people from New Orleans, whether or not you are a musician, people from New Orleans understand that music is part of their birthright, right? It's something that you can reach out and take because right. this is part of who you are. It's there waiting for you. And I think that I was raised to believe that that was true with writing and literature. Mm -hmm. and, and Chicago is very famous for uh, literatures of everyday people, of working class people, people like Carl Sandburg, Sandra Cisneros, Gwendolyn Brooks, Stuart Dybeck, all have these great traditions of writing about the people on your block. Right. And so I think that that's part of it, is that it helped me see myself as a writer at a very young age. And there's a very robust infrastructure in the city to kind of support that. Um, 
The second thing is that I think living, you know, there are ways, and I think live, Chicagoans are very petty and have very long memories. So when you meet somebody from Chicago, even if they're 90 years old, the first question they'll ask mm -hmm. each other is, where'd you go to high school? And they, what, what they really want to know is, who do I know that you know? Yeah. Who are, we have this saying, nobody wants nobody, nobody sent, right? Meaning if nobody sent you, then I don't, who are you? I don't want to talk to you, <laughs> right? No, and who are your people? Who can I ask about you? What have I heard about you? Can mm -hmm. I trust you? Are you trustworthy? And uh, it's a reason why another Chicago local ADM is um, he's from out of town. And he's from out of town is an explanation people give whenever someone fails at something or does something. It's, it's, it's meant to explain <laughs> one's ineptitude. So if you say, you know, like, so-and-so can't parallel park. Well, you know, he's from out of town, <laughs> you know. Or, boy, you know, this person is really messing up the school systems. Well, you know, they're from out of town. So, And so uh, I think that but part of this pettiness uh, calls one to be accountable. So sometimes people will ask me, like, how do you stay accountable to your communities? I'm like, I live here, and people will come for me, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. People know my mom. People know my brother. People know my family. And, you know, I, w I can be on the bus in Chicago or in the grocery store, and someone will be like, Ghost in the schoolyard, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it means that I can't just I can't just write books that are about, you know, the inner city youth and how they, they're at risk and they're you know, it's just because because nobody wants to be written about in that way. And no one will like me and then I won't be able to live my life or do any more research. And I think that that kind of model I try to always write about people in a way that they would that they would feel good about it if mm -hmm. they read what I wrote, right? And mm -hmm. I think that comes from you. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a tenet of portraiture. It means that you're not always going to write something that people would have written themselves no. or that they'll even like, per se, in a superficial way, but it needs to feel true to them. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to say, okay, yeah, you got mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And I think the third thing, it's certainly true that I'm obsessed with Chicago, but I think actually the secret sauce about that is that it's not only about the city and what in, which I live, what I'm trying to do is model what it looks like to ask critical questions about the place where you're from, whatever that place may be. Mm -hmm. And so when I travel around and, for example, ghosts, right, with that, when I talk about that book, usually what I end with is I want people to think, okay, in Dallas or in Detroit or in Philly or in Oakland or in Paris, what are the histories of this place that people don't want you to know? Mm -hmm. Why don't you know them? Who is invested in your not knowing? Right? And how did that come to be? And every place around the world, because we live in the society that we live in, certainly in this country, but all around the world, has hidden histories, right? It has people in power who were invested in keeping those histories hidden. And so that's really what I'm trying to do. And I'm also trying to model a kind of collective, collectivity in my work uh, where you know, people will say, how come Chicago has so many great rappers or great writers or things like that? And most of what we do to build those systems is very cheap and replicable, mm -hmm. right? It just means like inviting your friend to come do the thing with you right. instead of just trying to do it by yourself. And you can do that wherever you live. Wonderful. The other, another way in which I think something that brings synergy to your work that is central is your identity as teacher mm -hmm. and how that gets expressed through all these various things you do. Can you talk about that? Sure. One thing I do is I read all of my talks from a piece of paper, which I got from <laughs> one of my teachers. I don't ad lib ever. Um, I think that, so I began my career as a middle school teacher. And um, prior to that, uh, I was a, like an aide in a first grade class and a second grade class. Um, and I've taught in community settings. I've taught little people. I've taught grown up people. Um, and I think that teaching, number one, it forces you to really know something. Mm -hmm. Like, you really got to get it. If you didn't get it before, you better really get it now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I was your teaching fellow, mm -hmm. right? And it means that you assign these readings, and then people come in, and they ask you to explain Bronfenbrenner. You yeah. better know Bronfenbrenner. <laughs> if you didn't know the first time, you about to know now, you know? <laughs> and so I think that's part of it is I like the kind of deep knowing that teaching necessitates. I think I'm also obsessed and addicted to how intellectually challenging it is, yeah. especially when it comes to young people. Mm -hmm. Because when you are, you know, I began my teaching career, I was, I, you know, I had 180 students. I was a science teacher in a school where I was the only, I began as a science teacher, I switched to English, but I began, I was the only science teacher for grades six through eight, mm -hmm. right? 
And mm. as a side note, this was all, you know, funding. Like when you're my principal, we had an art teacher and then she was like, we need to have language. We need to have foreign language. So we had to fire the art teacher and lay her off in order to have Chinese. And the Chinese teacher also had to teach, to teach algebra. Right. And so when people are, you know, when I come to Harvard or other places where people are talking about education policy, it's like this is the reality of a, a school leader being like, do we want to have math or art or language, right? And which of these things, all of which I know are crucially important for raising the kind of young people that I want to raise, which do we get to cut? So I was the only science teacher for 180 kids. And when you're looking at 180 little people and you're trying to explain why the sky is blue or what is inside the earth, right? Or these very abstract concepts. And you have to, if they don't get it, you have to really think, you have to do these intellectual backflips of what are the 10 different ways when I go into my classroom today that I can explain the same thing, mm -hmm. right? And that is just, to me, that's the most rigorous intellectual work I have ever done or will ever do. And it makes it all the more ironic and tragic that people so deeply devalue teaching as, as being intellectual work, so deeply. And what I always say, you know, like now I've been on The Daily Show and I NPR and all these things. When I was a middle school teacher, I was pretty much the same person. I had the same ideas and the same abilities. Not, you know, I came to grad school and I learned some things. But for the most part, I was the same person. <laughs> and when I was a sixth grade, when I was interviewing sixth grade teacher, nobody really wanted to hear my opinions about these things, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I always say that to interviewers to make them feel really bad. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, I'm like, will you come on NPR and talk about this thing? And so, you know, I think that I, I just think it's so intellectually challenging. And I just love being around kids. I just mm -hmm. really like kids. I think kids are funny. I think middle school kids are funny and awesome. And I, I'm, I think I, my own development kind of arrested at age like 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, and I just, you know, what I love about middle school students that I think other people hate is that they show all their emotions all the time. I just, I'm so into that. I think that's awesome. So if they're sad, they come in and they're like, this is the saddest day of my life. I'm like, yes, lean in, <laughs> lean into the sadness. Right? And they come in, they're like, this is the greatest day. I'm like, yes, it <laughs> is. It is the greatest day. And I just, I'm so into those feelings. I just think it's great. So I love teaching, and I think that um, now as a professor, I've, I, I've really found ways of enjoying teaching bigger people, too. I mean, one thing is you can go to the bathroom whenever you want yeah. when you're a professor. And another thing is that if you don't, if you don't explain something clearly, the person in front of you, their instinct is not going to be just like to punch someone next to right? Like yeah. with middle school, the stakes are just like, if you're like, this explanation was not clear, therefore I'm now bored, therefore I'm just going to slap this person for no, for no reason. And uh, that just, that's good. It makes for good praxis, you know? Yeah. Do you think of yourself teaching through your poetry, teaching through your comic book writing, that's, teaching through like, absolutely. sociology? Mm -hmm. Well. A great thinker once said that we can never conflate schooling and education, right? And so, uh, the great thinker was you. Uh, <laughs> for the people in the audience who don't get subtlety. And so, uh, I think of it as being educational work. I think of it as yeah. teaching. And I think of it partially through, my, my good friend Nate Marshall, who was mentioned in the intro because I wrote a, a play with him, uh, he once said, the greatest thing a poem or a poet can give is permission. And when I was here at Hugsy, I had that tacked onto my uh, little office bulletin board thing because I think that, you know, Gwendolyn Brooks gave me permission. She gave me permission to look out my window and to write about the people that were outside. Um, Amy Tan gave me permission, right? Mm -hmm. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot gave me permission. And I think that part of what I want to do in my work is to make people think like these are okay things to write about, right? Especially mm -hmm. as a black woman, when I wrote Electric Arches, it was, you know, that book, I, I worked on much of it like in the period between 2013 and 2015 when all of black art had to be about death all the time. Mm. And I just wanted to write a book that would allow us to imagine a different way of being without, without ignoring death or suffering, right? But that would allow us to imagine something beyond and further. And so that's why I just wrote all these like weird time travel poems and stuff. And I just, I feel like when I was growing up, it seemed like to be a black woman poet, you had to write extensively and exclusively about your own suffering. Mm -hmm. And I never really wanted to do that. I have therapy. I pay for therapists. I have good friends. I don't really need everybody to know all my business. <laughs> and I don't like to write about the most traumatic things that have ever happened to me. I'd like mm -hmm. to write about other things. And so I hope that my work is giving that kind of permission. And in the case of 1919, it is certainly a much more explicitly uh, educational book because I wanted it to, it's a period of time that a lot of people don't know about. 
And I just wanted to write about it in a way that would be an easy entry point uh, where people could get to know something about this horrifically violent period without having to read like a 300 page nonfiction book. Right. Let me see the time. I'm terrible. You know. One more question. Okay, sounds and good. And then let's open it up for, for folks in the audience to make comments and ask questions. Um, very interested in, in sort of the methods you use, the tools you use, the modalities you use. I'm interested in the places, the physical spaces where you work. Yeah. All of that kind of nitty gritty. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in how you picture your audiences, mm -hmm. what you wear. And to write? Yeah. Or in life, no. my life? No. Yeah. <laughs> When you speak to these different audiences, yeah. I'm interested in that kind of very specific detail. Yeah, the how, the how. The how you do your doing work. Doing the writing. Right. Okay, I'm trying to track. There was methods, places, sartorial practices, <laughs> audiences. Perfect. Yes. I yes. think audiences was third. And yeah. Okay. So in terms of methods, you know, Octavia Butler once was asked, what's your inspiration for writing? And she said, I live with, you know, my landlord lives downstairs. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I, you know... <laughs> I think one of the greatest myths about writing is that it has something to do with this thing called inspiration. Mm -hmm. I'm not independently wealthy, so I can't wait for inspiration mm -hmm. to come. I have bills today, you know? <laughs> and so I think that, uh, you know, I think that writing, I see writing as my work. Mm -hmm. And there's an amazing Seamus Heaney poem uh, called Digging, right? And it's about watching his, his older male relatives dig for peat in the Irish countryside. And at the end, he says, you know, I have this pen, I'll dig with it. And so even if we're not talking, about I'm blessed that I don't have to dig peat for right or work in a factory like my grandfather did or those kinds of things I don't have to feed myself through those things but it means that I have to have that same ethos about my writing and my work it has to be done and unfortunately no one is gonna do it if I don't do it every time I have to write something I sit down and look at the computer and I think please let it just come out of my brain right and it never does there's no self writing book and yeah. so there's only one there are two options either I write the thing or it doesn't get written right and you know, that's that. And so I just try to bring that kind of, uh, it means that I write when I don't feel like it, even though I often, like many writers, truly hate writing. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and I think that that is just, the, you just have to handle your business. And um, in terms of methods, I write better in the morning. Um, I like to have a dedicated place. I recently moved and uh, I almost got rid of this desk that I got when I first, when I was living in Boston, I bought this desk in Somerville. It's great because I'm never in a place where I can tell all the wonderful details of this desk. <laughs> so I bought this desk in Somerville at a place called Tony and Anna's Furniture. Has anyone ever been to Tony and Anna's Furniture? Oh, you need to go. Because I bought this desk, it was like 60 or $70 and it's a solid wood desk and it's a child's school desk. So it's about this big, and what Tony and Anna did is they found it somewhere and they painted it all one color. So the whole thing is red, and it mm -hmm. just has these brass fixtures. It's just this, and it has what I like about it is it has all these carvings that kids like, you know, carved in it with pens and stuff, and they're all just painted over. And so I just, it has like little gum residue mm -hmm. on the underside, <laughs> and it's just really, and I almost got rid of it when I moved, and I just thought, what was I thinking? I mean, this desk is really the whole secret, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it's the whole secret sauce. And so I like to have a, a dedicated place. Um, I like to sit down and, and just, I put my phone in a drawer or I hide it out of view or something. I like to just sit down and do my work. And, um, but I didn't always have that privilege. And so, you know, I used to write poems on napkins while I worked at a restaurant. I used to mm -hmm. work at a call center. I'd be served anywhere I've worked. I've always just been surreptitiously trying to write. And, um, so that's kind of the ethos and the method part. Um, the second thing was, uh, before audience methods, something, audience, and dress, clothes. Place. Place. We talked a little bit about place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do like my favorite place in the world to write is the Harold Washington Public Library in Chicago. Um, I've been writing there since I was 11 or 12 years old. And so there's something really cool about going into a place and thinking, I wrote my dissertation here and I wrote my seventh grade science fair project here. Um, also, the Harold Washington Library has all kinds of undigitized archival material that's literally just in a like old folder that some that somebody recycled or a binder that's shoved on a shelf and a lot of the statistics and data from Ghost in the Schoolyard I could only have written with this information mm -hmm. from this place and in particular there's all this community data and uh, statistics and stuff that I only knew where they were and where to find them for this book because when I was in high school my teacher made us do a project 
about our neighborhood. And he said, uh, you need to go to the fifth floor of the Chicago Public Library, the Harold Washington Library, and go to the municipal desk. And on the, there's a shelf. And on this shelf, and literally, I used that information to write hmm. Ghosts in the Schoolyard. And so, uh, you know, that's... I. He was a mediocre teacher in some ways, but, uh, but he helped me with the book. Um, so I like to write there. I like to write in public libraries. I like to write where children are. I like the sound of kids playing. Um, and I like to write at a desk, not in bed. I think that's a really bad practice. <laughs> and then the thing about audiences, you know, I've been thinking about this recently because something I'm very proud of is that the award that Electric Arch has won from the American Library Association was the Alex Award, and it's, award, it's an award they give every year, and it's for the book which is not designated as a YA book that is very good for young people. Hmm. And so that was like, I was like, yes, I feel seen. Thank you, librarians, because um, first of all, librarians are kind of like teachers in a lot of mm -hmm, ways, so mm -hmm. I really am, I love librarians, but I, that's kind of, I think I'm, I teach everything like it's middle school, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I think I write everything for this nebulous, either precocious 13 or 14 year old or childlike adult. Mm -hmm. I think all the things that I write are kind of written for this mm -hmm. ageless person that doesn't exist. But I'm always, I don't, I think of all of my work as writing for young people, mm -hmm. regardless of uh, whether it has that title or not. And Ghosts in the Schoolyard, there are groups of high school students in Chicago who've read it in their classes. I met with a group of kids from the South Side who read my book and then they interviewed people in their neighborhood about school mm -hmm. closings and made a zine about it. I mean, uh, young people have yeah. just done amazing things with this work. And with that book, every single sentence I wrote, um, and we share an editor, Elizabeth Branch Dyson, who's a really um, honest, brutally honest black woman editor, and every, she told me in an early draft of my book, she said, you said you want this to be for general audiences, but parts of it now are very boring. Mm -hmm. And I said, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you for that. And so I went back and when I revised that book in the last revision, every single sentence I asked myself, would my mother understand this? And would Cheryl Watkins, who was my principal, understand this. And I'm uh, John Willett, who was a statistics professor here at Hugsey, who's now retired, he always said, you should write your statistical work for a naive but intelligent audience, mm -hmm. right? Somebody who doesn't know, they don't happen to know, you know a lot about this area, but they care about it and they're mm -hmm. smart. And so how are you going to, this is where the pedagogical part comes in. I'm always thinking of myself as holding somebody's hand and trying mm -hmm. to help them get uh, across some stones that are traversing a river, right? We're just gonna go from here to here, and then we're gonna go from here to here. Mm -hmm. um, clothes, I just like to wear good clothes. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, I almost, the earrings that you gave me, I got here and I discovered that I only had one of them and I was really sad. Yeah, I was gonna wear both of them. <laughs> And then I thought about wearing just the one, and I thought that wasn't good. But I do think that Jordans are dress shoes, and I think that, uh, and so I like to, I like to wear Jordans to work sometimes, and just wish someone would ask me something, that, you know, uh, because I think about, I think about the sartorial practices of Black communities and how those should, you know, those are also legitimate forms of kind of dress, dress up. Right. Good. Wonderful. Um, the floor is open for questions, and there are two microphones. If anyone wants to get up and ask a question or make a comment. Thank you so much. This has been so lovely. Hi, this side of the room. We'll go back and forth. Why don't we start with you? Right. Um, I don't know if this is on. Okay. Um, good evening. Thank you again, Thank um, you. Dr. Ewing and Professor Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot. Um, my name is Gary Mitch. I'm a PhD student here. And one of the questions that I have for both of you, um, I really appreciated this, um, your delineation of feminism. And one of the things that I'm trying to grapple with is how do we sort of reconcile uplifting the collective while also recognizing that we live in this patriarchal and individualistic society. And so for instance, you said, Dr. Ewing, that um, people treat you differently or re sort of revere your opinions differently now that you have certain institutions backing you. And so how do we, um, as students, as people as people from communities sort of reconcile those those simultaneously wanting to transform systems while also having to participate in them in order to get sure. credibility yeah 
Do you want to go, go ahead, first? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you asked, a, you snuck in a different question at the end. <laughs> I think that's a, the question about individuality and collectivity is one, but then I think you're also pointing out something important about participating in systems that you also hope to upend. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those are two related but distinct questions. The first part about working collectively, I mean, it, I, don't, I don't think you should like be hungry or not have your rent paid because you're so busy trying to work collectively, right? Like you still need to do the things you need to do to eat and uh, dress yourself. And so, but I think that there are ways in which we can intervene and challenge, uh, challenge presumptions of always doing everything individually. And I think that's on kind of a case by case basis. I mean, one small thing, like I have two colleagues uh, that finished their doctorate here, and they wrote one of their major papers together. They co-authored this paper as graduate students, right? And that was just a small thing that um, is sort of not really encouraged because how are you going to get your individual shine, you know, if you do that? Um, another example for me was that in writing Ghost in the Schoolyard, it was very important to me that the IRB let me not anonymize the setting or the neighborhood or the names of the schools or the names of the organizers, uh, the organizing entities. Um, all of the uh, individual people in Ghosts in the Schoolyard that are not famous, they do have pseudonyms because I think people don't sign up for wanting to be you know, harassed and targeted and things like that. But the organizations in the schools and some of the things that happen publicly, those are real people's names. And I just felt like it was really important to not erase those contributions. And I understand that's just counter to you know the logics of how social science works often. But I wanted people to be able to build on my work by knowing that, that we were writing about the same place, right? And that's something that bothers me a lot about a lot of ethnographic work where they've used a pseudonym, is that like we, sometimes we all know, like we all know it's North London, like we all know what the place is, but you can't build, it, it limits the degree to which you're able to build, like work collectively because of that. The latter thing you said was about um, existing within institutions and while also trying to transform them and recognize that they're dangerous. And I, I think that for me, another black feminist idea is being able to understand that multiple things are true at once. Um, and so I think both of those things can be true, uh, that you are on the one hand trying to exist and survive and thrive within a system that is harmful to you, while on the other hand speaking truth to power about the nature of that harm. And I also just think that um, it's really important to remember that the systems that we want to upend have been in place over the course of centuries and had a lot of power and a lot of weight and a lot of important people to construct them and a lot of the same invested in their continued maintenance. And so therefore, I think it's really unfair to ourselves as well as a manifestation of the same kind of hyper-individualism when we think we're going to transform. Like whenever people talk about this, this, you know, and I've had this conversation with some people in this room about places like Harvard or about places like the University of Chicago. People show up and fall and they're like, I'm going to transform Harvard. I'm like, no, you're not, fam. This is a 380 some year old institution, right? It has billions of dollars and countless collective effort of powerful people invested in keeping it the way it is. What you're going to do is take the things that you need, right? And you're also going, ooh, is that? I hope that's on my phone. No, but that's my ringtone. You know when somebody else's phone rings? It's your ringtone. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I think we need to be patient with ourselves. And what I see my work as doing, I see, I see my job as uh, learning with humility from the people who came before me and had the exact same struggle, trying not to repeat their mistakes, building on their work, and leaving a legacy for the people after me to do the same. I don't see myself as trying to change the world in the maybe 100 years that I have, if, if I'm lucky that I have on earth. I think that doing that, thinking that way is really, there's a lot of hubris in that, um, and that it's really harmful. So I think that, you know, how do we challenge these systems and name what they are while we can, while we're alive? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I need to say more, but I would just say that it is possible to hold two things in tension yeah. and in, even in balance that are happening at the same time. And so to commit to collectivity, you can also commit at the same time to radical self-definition, mm -hmm. right, of your individual ways. And I think, in, I think much of the creativity and artistry that you're talking about has to do with bringing your own individual imprint, your own individual signature, the way you see the world yeah. um, to the fore. And, if, and it's, it's best if it's different from yeah. those around you. So I think both of these things 
need to coexist, even if there's a feeling of tension within them. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank you, Thank Gary. You. Yes, ma'am. Hello, hello, testing, testing. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Nice. Thank you both so much for coming. This event has been fantastic. I'm so grateful, Dr. Ewing, that you brought up you. kind of the roles. Could you say who you are? Cause I'm oh, I'm Amanda. And you are? I'm a senior at the college. And you are? Oh, I'm the U.S. Youth Poet Laureate. Is that what you want yes, to say? Yes, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for that. I thought you tried it. That's okay. Yeah, I thought we can go down the list. I was like, I'm black. I'm a woman. Like, how far? <laughs> yeah. you know? um, but I'm so glad that you brought up kind of the roles of social sciences and poetry. Like I mentioned, I'm studying sociology at the college, and as a poet, I want to imagine what is possible. And a lot of times when I go to office hours with professors, they tell me sociology tells you what is. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested, from your perspective as someone who is multi-hyphenate, how do you then let the knowledge of sociology inform your poetry without those ideological traditions constraining your imagination. And yeah. also, Professor Lawrence Lightfoot would love your feedback as well, because when I was advocating for poetic portraits in my junior tutorial, I used so many quotations from you. So it's great. <laughs> that, <laughs> the two icons are on the stage, just like oh, I'm so you. firm. Thank you so much. Well, I think that... Um, there's selective historicizing taking place here, right? And so uh, I every year go to the Association of Black Sociologists Conference, and it's my favorite conference for a lot of reasons. Number one, there's a house party. Most conferences <laughs> don't have a house party. Uh, but another reason is because it reminds me that as long as there have been social scientists, there have been black people asking these same questions. W.E.B. Du Bois, right? And writing poetry. And write, wrote novels, they, right, made these infographics. He was out here doing what he felt like doing. Zora Neale Hurston, right, anthropologist, novelist, and this is, and again, maybe because I had the privilege of, of being trained by Professor Lawrence Lightfoot, I never, I have always felt, when people tell me, oh, well, sociology doesn't do this or that, I always feel sad that they haven't read widely enough. And as always, as people of color, as black people, we are expected to be to have these multiple canons, right? So many people who come through this institution have to teach themselves and make their own canons because the people who are supposed to be training them just don't have the range. And so, um, you know, that's, that's really what it comes down to. And so uh, I think that... I do think that for me, sociology is more about documenting reality, but I see myself doing that in service of asking these questions about how things couldn't be otherwise. And I think that that is, that what we have the power to do as social scientists is that re to remind people that human society, as we understand it, is constructed. Therefore, we can deconstruct it and reconstruct it, right? Part of what I, what I wrote about in Ghosts in the Schoolyard and all my work is, you know, God didn't come down from on high and say, school quality is, you know, assessed by NAEP, right? Like that is a thing that people invented. And so I think that that's our job as social scientists is to point out these things are constructed. Why are they constructed that way? Who does that serve? And what are alternate constructions and other ways of looking at things, right? As somebody who studies race, I think it's really important to look at uh, both the different ways that groups have been racialized in the United States to serve different social purposes, as well as like why do we define blackness one way in the U.S. and one way in South Africa? Well, because it served the oppressive white supremacist regimes of those two governments in different ways, right? So that's those are the kinds of questions that I think it's our job to ask. And you know, uh, the Scholar Denied is a good book. Souls of Black Folk written a good century ago, right? Like, I, you know, you have to build the canon that you, that you need, but it's out there for you. I would just say that um, poetry and sociology, at least the way I practice it, require very, very close observation, right? And I was thinking, as Eve was reading her poem, about the incredible, specific, close observation of, of everything that was going on and how we could all see it. And it seems to me that's also a great practice of social science field research as well. So I think there are lots of ways in which art and science not only are at attention with one another, but need each other mm. and blend with one another. Um, and I think it's good to get comfortable with that and even comfortable with the discomfort that's implied 
in many academic institutions. Thank you. Yep. Let's make this the last question because we need to end promptly. I'm sorry. You can find me on Twitter 47 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, thank you both once again. Uh, my name is Brandon Colvin. I am a graduate student at the grad school of ed here uh, in the TIE program, Technology Innovation and Education program. And um, my question is about accountability. Um, I would, I'm interested in both of you all's responses to how men in general, in particular black men, uh, can functionally and meaningfully uh, be better partners in supporting the work and also positively contributing to uh, feminist ideas, the deconstruction of patriarchy, uh, and also collaborating both individually and collectively with black feminists. Mm, what a great question. Do you want to go ahead and ask me? Okay. Um, yeah, that's such a great question. I think that, and I appreciate you for asking it. I think that I'll answer this with specific regard to black men as the example you gave, but I just want to say I think this is true of anybody within any social group who is trying to do meaningful solidarity work who occupies a position of comparative privilege, right? So that doesn't just mean privilege in the world, right? Like there are ways in which black men do not occupy positions of privilege in the world, but comparative privilege as the cis person among trans people, as, you know, as the non-disabled person among disabled people, whatever the situation may be. I think that it's just the practice of listening and asking questions where you are truly ready to hear the answer, right? And humility and being comfortable not being the center of the room or the center of conversation are such important and such difficult uh, practices to, to, to practice. And, you know, I think about when I was a kid, my vision that I was always given, the, the picture we were given of what it meant to be a black freedom fighter and what it meant to be a hero was to be a man, right? And so what what message does that send? And the message that it sends is that I think in a lot of organizing spaces and liberation spaces, you know, black men who have truly good hearts and good intentions become accustomed to being made the center of conversations, become accustomed to being made leaders by default. And I think that that is just a good thing to question within ourselves. And um, I think the same is true when we think about racial justice more broadly. When we think about telling white people, like, get it's OK for you to be uncomfortable, right? I love Robin D'Angelo's framing of racial stamina, uh, which is that she says basically, like, white people just have very little racial stamina, meaning that uh, any conversation about race starts to freak people out and they get uncomfortable, right? Like, I knew what the Klan was when I was, like, five. Right. I got called the N word for the first time when I was uh, five or six years old. And so my parents, our parents never had the possibility of like, when am I going to have the race conversation with my kid? Right. The world is having the race conversation with your kid. And so that allows you to live a life as a white person where you don't have a lot of racial stamina. You know, it's like when you go to work out for the first time and you walk two blocks and your legs hurt, right? Black people, we have a lot of racial stamina because we've been running the marathon since we were in second grade. And I think the same is true with gender. I think what would it look like to practice having gen more gender stamina? Maybe you saw the um, viral video. This is an important scholarly text. The viral video that recently circulated of, of um, Kevin Hart and Lil Nas X talking. There's a video where they're, it's in the shop and they're asking Lil Nas X, why did you think it was important to say that you were gay? Like, why did you think it was important to come out as a gay rapper? And throughout the conversation, Kevin Hart is like freaking out. Like, he's just like visibly uncomfortable. He's just like twitching and like, you know, getting really defensive. And like, for, it's like, fam, you are so freaking out right now for no reason. And I think that's an example of having very poor gender stamina or sexuality stamina. We're just having a person sitting there being like, yes, I'm gay and blah, 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 is just freaking him out. And so I think, you know, reading texts that talk openly about these things, attending events where you might be the only man there, or you might be the only cis person there, or you might be the only whatever there, um, asking people questions and being willing to listen to the answer, even if it's upsetting or indicts you in some way. I think that these are all ways that we, that we build our stamina. And we also just practice stepping aside sometimes. Saying that you are feminist and engaging in feminist oh. practices. Mm -hmm. sorry. I'm sorry. Did Microphone. you hear? Yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's in the way that Eve talked about it, that black men doing that at the same time. I grew up in a house where I was telling Eve um, when I was eight years old, or almost eight years old, I heard my father say to his colleagues, who he invited 
to the house for dinner on Sunday. And these were sort of the five black PhDs teaching in the universities uh, who were his brother scholars. And I heard him say, I was eight and I was setting the table, I'm a feminist. That's in 1956, maybe. Uh, and I was panicked because I didn't know what that word meant. And I knew he loved my mother. And I knew he was faithful to her. And I knew he seemed like a man-man. And was he saying, I am effeminate? Was he saying, I'm feminine? Was he, was he saying, I'm a homosexual? And my parents had lots of homosexual friends, lots of artists, friends, and poets who were out even at that time. Was he saying that he was, what was he doing with it? And very scary. <laughs> uh, and my family had a tradition that on every birthday for the kids, for, the, for we three kids, that our biggest present was that we could ask any question we wanted to. And we could get I, so a true answer. So this is terrifying answer. to me, not a terrifying idea. <laughs> we could get a true answer. That was the big gift, right? Uh, and so two weeks later, I had my eighth birthday, and I used it as an opportunity to ask my father in front of my mother and my siblings, <laughs> what did you mean when you said you were feminine? And he said, what? And I said, what did you mean when you were talking to your friends and you said you were feminine? And he said, no, I didn't say that. I said I was a feminist. And that means wasn't the definition that Dr. Ewing gave, but it means equality of men and women um, in the doing of it as much as in the, in the practice of it, in practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think standing up there, I still feel that, how glorious that must have made my mother feel. It's in the doing of it, in the loving of it, in the loving through it, mm -hmm. um, that I think the brothers need to get, get going on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all so much. Which, thank you. I will, uh, thank you. Stand up. Thank you. He's the one. Okay. We, I just want to say. This has been an amazing experience. You have been a fabulous audience. And Eve is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person and scholar and artist. Um, and thank you for coming this evening. Uh, please, those of you who would like to buy a book and get it signed, go through the door of stage left. I think that's stage left, um, to my left anyway. And um, Eve will be there signing books. Thank okay. you. Can I hug you again? Yeah. Yeah.